Do you want me to do it in French? Because I can't do the whole thing in French. It's like the worst episode of Long Lost Family you've ever seen. In <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what you want to book for radio is a good talkers. Yeah. People who can talk. People who are relaxed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Diane, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. And what an intro. <laughs> well, that's all right. We try. We try. It's all true. <laughs> and it's all true. I haven't made any of that up. I can make a bit up if you want me to. Where would I start? I love the way you said one or two things have been happening in the last year. I mean, it's been an absolute roller coaster. I was doing so many technology stories, they decided to call me technology correspondent. I am surrounded, in fact, I'm surrounded by Lego mechs, um, among other things, because my husband is in a meeting downstairs, and I think that he's decided his meeting is more important. You with this guy in Greece, and he, he was Greek? Uh, no, so he was actually Welsh. Um, oh, okay. Yes. I thought, well, if I write a book, then more people will hear about me and I'll be invited kindly on podcasts like this. In this episode of the HR Resource Insight podcast, we meet the incredibly inspirational Sophie Green. I say inspirational, and I don't use that word lightly, because Sophie overcame some quite significant stumbling blocks in her early life to turn into like the artist. She is somebody that is currently displaying her artwork at an exhibition at the Oxo and Canary Wharf. And this recording actually took place at that venue. So if you check us out on the YouTube channel, you'll be able to see exactly what we're talking about. Although we do try to describe it as best we can during the podcast. Now, Sophie has had quite the journey. Uh, we cover a lot of ground, not least of which a very interesting conversation about body doubles. But that's a whole new story, and you'll have to tune in and listen to that one. Uh, and also how she took the leap of faith and followed a passion, something I am 100% behind. And I'm so glad she did, because she's helping not only to share some fantastic artwork and create fantastic pieces, but she's doing so, and at the same time, helping to save those who are the subjects of her artwork. Join me and Sophie in this absolutely fascinating and entertaining conversation. I'm absolutely delighted today to have on the HR Resource podcast, the wonderful Sophie Green. Uh, we're going to be having a conversation that's going to cover quite a few areas, not least of which her tremendous artwork. If you have the benefit of watching this on a YouTube channel, you can see behind Sophie some of the examples of her work. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, we're going to have a go at trying to describe this work for you. And I'm going to hand that bit over to Sophie. Sophie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I don't know if I'm going to do the best job at describing the artwork, but um, basically it's photorealistic. Some people call it hyper-realistic animal portraits. Um, and this particular collection, the animals are sort of coming out of the darkness. So quite striking, striking contrast and um, yeah. Contrast Literally the one, as I'm looking over you, it's, it's sort of to the right hand side of it, to your left shoulder, is called out of the darkness, isn't it? That's that's the uh, the Black Panther. It is very good knowledge. I'm very impressed. You've done your research. <laughs> Absolutely, I need to know who I'm talking to. <laughs> but it's, I love. I mean, we had a little go, didn't we, on social media about naming um, and the other, what well, the one that I actually had to go up with your pangolin, which is over yeah. your other shoulder. Um, because I've got a background in working with law firms, I actually thought about scales of justice that, and, and somebody actually came up with it, which, and they did it far better than I did. So yeah. uh, so it's called scales of injustice. Yeah, which is very fitting because um, pangolins are the most trafficked animal, well, the most trafficked mammal in yeah. the world. So really, really good name. I have to admit that naming the paintings is my least favourite thing to do. Um, so that, that's kind of why I I palm that responsibility off on either my social media followers or my dad. So that's a great <laughs> yeah. way to get engagement, though. It's fabulous. Yeah, I mean, it, I enjoy it, and I never would have thought of a name like Scales of Injustice. So, yeah. you know, great, great name for that one. And then Out of the Darkness was my dad. <laughs> he named that one. Well, that's perfect. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I can't lay claim to fame to many things, but I once named a cocktail for Birmingham Royal Ballet because of a celebration of an event that they were putting on. They had a new cocktail they wanted to produce in conjunction with a with a bar, with a national bar. And I called this sort of pink concoction on point and I won the prize. So I, I've actually named a cocktail. Wow, that's amazing. Have you ever made the cocktail before? I, my, my other daughter, Georgie, we were in Newcastle 
in the particular bar and uh, and uh, she tried it and uh, and really enjoyed it. So, oh, so, right. so we you should, should, um, you should make it one day and have like a cocktail party at your house and, and be like, this is my cocktail. <laughs> I know. The ballet, my wife, my wife actually runs a ballet school, so she's she should probably get involved in that one as well. Oh, Enough about that uh, and about about me. I mean, you are, are, are really somebody who is, as I think Star is, is uh, ascending at the moment with so many things that are going on for you and not least of which the uh, the the exhibition of which you're at right now we're, we're fabulously talking to you early stages of the exhibition which is which is already going tremendously well um but what i'd like to do is just just understand a little bit more of your background it's something i like to do with guests is just to understand who they are where they come from um and I, i'm going to ask you a question whether you know the answer to or not some comes readily to you what do you think is your earliest memory what's one of those things that sort of pops into your head when you think about your childhood Hmm. I don't know if it's the answer that you're going to be hoping for, um, but I have a memory in my mind, but I think I might have invented it. <laughs> I think I might have like seen a photo or something, but I have, I seem to have some kind of memory of um, being in kind of a bit like a, I guess like a car seat or some kind of seat thing for babies or toddlers. Yeah. And they just put me under the dining room table because they were obviously like doing stuff. <laughs> wanted to put me somewhere safe where I wasn't going to be like trod on or something. And and I, I seem to have that in my mind as a memory, but I don't know if I've just invented that. Um, so I, instead, I'm going to go with um, when I was a little bit older. And I remember, um, so I'm the youngest in my family by uh, five years, five years between me and my, the middle sibling. And so um, my brother and sister were both at school when I was sort of like a young, young child. Yeah. And, and my mum, as the the fourth child to be born, my mum was kind of like, okay, let's just leave her to do whatever she wants to do now. It's kind of it was very hands off parenting. I think you know when you have a first child, it's sort of like, oh, we, you know, you're the you're our world. And then by the by the last child, it's like, yes, just do whatever. So I was sat on. Yeah, sat I've on. got to be careful what I say because in response to that, because I've got three children, so <laughs> I, was say. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> even if you don't say, you know. <laughs> Um, there's like no childhood photos of me, but there's about four million photos of my brother, who's the eldest. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, was, I remember my mum sort of put some toys out on the porch and I was just sort of sat out on the porch on my own playing with these toys. Yeah. And um, yeah, just doing what kids do. And my mum would have been inside just doing chores and stuff. But yeah, weirdly, that's my, my earliest memory. Uh, my, to, to, to share with you, my, my earliest memory, a bit traumatic, was being dragged to church on a wet and cold day in Peterborough. And I must have been because we moved to Gloucester uh, when I was not quite three. So I must have been quite young. I must have been about two and a half or something. Yeah. So. Listen. It's funny, isn't it, how if you have something quite traumatic or emotional, then it's more likely to stay with you, whereas like a, a general run-of-the-mill memories don't kick in until you're a bit older, I think. That's right, that's right. I mean, what one of the things that um, I've listened to also to a couple of your, I'll be properly stalking you, by the way, Sophie. Oh, great. Uh, a couple <laughs> of things that, that I picked up on was the fact that um, you had a selective mutism, which which I, I, I'm i vaguely aware of, hadn't we really looked at, and I've looked into, and it's not as uncommon as, I actually, because, because of my lack of knowledge, I think, and obviously it's something that must be very rare. It's not that rare, is it? No, I, I think I might be wrong because I haven't looked into this for a while, but when, last time I checked, I think it was like one in a million or something, which oh, is- One in 140. Oh, and that it is. So I think that when I had it, it was about, it was classed as one in a million, but I think that's because less people were diagnosed. I think yes. yeah. women, but I think less people knew about it. Yeah. And I think that it was, a lot of people thought it was either stubbornness or shyness and that we you kind of choose not to speak or you're just a little bit quiet, but it's like a physical inability to speak. It's kind yeah. of like paralyzing fear. It's really strange. Um, I actually... I don't have too many memories of that stage of my life because I was just so anxious. <laughs> it's quite traumatic, but must have just been a very, very anxious child. And um, yeah, I think that memory of me sort of playing on the porch on my own kind of encompasses what I was like as a child because I was very, very introvert, very singular. I like to be outside. I loved animals, was absolutely obsessed with, with animals. I used to just sort of read encyclopedias or sit and make fact files about specific breeds of cat or I would um this was before we had a computer but I remember we had a computer at, at the school yeah. and um my mum and dad had to go in and have meetings with the teachers quite a lot because obviously I was the the uh 
you know the child that didn't speak wow. and uh, yeah I remember they would sort of sit me on the computer to play games and stuff while while uh, they spoke to the teacher and I used to just go on the internet and research cats and stuff yeah. it was just yeah I was just strange but <laughs> I, was oh, no, I, mean, I, I think I think we've all discovered I mean there was a, there's also misconceptions about that diagnosis like mm -hmm. as well that that it's connected with autism and certain sort of traumatic experiences that are, that are horrific and I think it's just one of those things that can develop and and, and, and clearly you've overcome it exactly yeah I think um yeah I was actually talking to someone about this yesterday who's a therapist and we were discussing the sort of like possible links between selective mutism and being on the autistic spectrum but then being a selective mute is really more of an anxiety thing which yeah. Right, yeah. can come hand in hand with being on the spectrum but in my case I think I mean I've looked into it so much because I've been so um, interested to know why on earth I had it because for all intents and purposes I had a fairly happy childhood I think um, some stuff happened that I won't go into uh, while I was in the womb and I thought maybe that might have impacted it but it's, it's one of those things I mean I, I vividly remember going from infant school which is four uh, four to seven yeah in junior school which is obviously seven to eleven and uh my sister my older sister was saying you're gonna get you're gonna get bullied if you don't start speaking and she was like everyone was pressuring me to start speaking before I moved to junior school yeah. and I did end up speaking and I will never forget the day that I started speaking um the teachers decided to make me read a book to the no. whole school not just the class the whole school oh <laughs> and I think, my goodness I think it was like we'll just throw her in at the deep end and then you know get it all out of the way because I think they knew it was going to be a bit weird if I just started talking all of a sudden and all the kids knew me as the kids that didn't speak I went to a really small little village infant school so there was only like a few hundred people or not not even that probably like a hundred children or something um and so we got all of the kids in the school into a room and I sat and I read a story and then afterwards all the kids were coming up to me and like with requests they were like say dog say cat say my name like I was saying all these words like it, I was a freak or something you know it's like a freak show or something and um yeah it reminds, never... me, reminds me of the scene in Love Actually where they're asking the guy he goes to America and they're asking him because he's got such a an English accent they're all asking oh Prada, what's that <laughs> bottle <laughs> Like yeah, it. and it was like bottle. Yeah, that was exactly <laughs> what it was like. And um, yeah, it was just a most bizarre thing. Um, and I don't know if that was a good thing or not. I mean, looking back, I'm kind of like, God, that was so cruel to sort of like throw me in at the it's deep end. Extreme, isn't it? But but it probably worked, didn't it? It, it, gave, did you, it, gave, you, it gave you that platform to say, oh, actually, I'm back. I'm I'm talking now. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing is as well is I think a lot of people presume that if you're if you have selective mutism, then that is a form of like social anxiety. But in my case, at least, it, it actually wasn't, um, I'm a very, very sociable person and, you know, it comes in handy now. I'm doing sort of like podcast interviews and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it was more a manifestation of general anxiety that meant that I just couldn't speak. But I wasn't actually socially anxious. No. I love people. I love um, talking to people, getting my opinions across. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just like a deep anxiety within me and a fear uh, or a lack of safety, which meant that I couldn't speak. And so when I started speaking and I went into junior school, um, I, I was always getting in trouble for talking. So it literally went- oh, How <laughs> I want it. It's getting it all out. And I used to, I remember this was back in the day when um, sort of sanctions were a little bit less, uh, probably a little bit less PC, but I remember I used to just walk into the assembly and before I'd even had a chance to sit down, one of the teachers would be like, Sophie, go and sit facing the wall. And I'd have to spend the whole assembly sitting facing the wall because they knew that if I sat next to someone, I would start talking or I'd be playing with someone's hair or something. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was it was strange. I kind of went from one extreme to the other um, and then kind of petered into normality a little bit after that. But... Through this through this thread of school and and finding your voice and and that, that, that there's one thing before, before you found your voice, you've had this interest in animals. Um, yes. And that that continued. Did that continue through into and and your interest in art? Had you always drawn? Had you always had a um, a passion for that? Yeah. So my interest in animals, I I think, is innate I, ever since I was born, and I think that that continued throughout my whole life. Yeah. The interest in art, um, I was never really 
innately gifted I would say um I wasn't the kid at school that's really really good at art I enjoyed it but I enjoyed it in the same way that most kids enjoy art because it's therapeutic and it's fun and you, you can experiment and stuff and uh yeah I think that it wasn't until I was probably a little bit older actually maybe sort of in my 20s that I thought actually I'd quite like to do this as a career and um, my brother is a very very talented artist as well and he used to kind of give me tips and stuff so I kind of did art on the side of whatever I was doing at the time because after college I went and worked in the film industry for a few years and then after that I uh, became a primary school teacher myself so I always sort of painted on the side of doing those things and it wasn't until I became a teacher and suddenly had no time at all because teaching is just such an all-consuming job. Uh, I suddenly was like, do you know what? I actually really love this. I want to kind of do it. But I, my, honestly, my passion for animals and wildlife is what kind of keeps me going. It's not as much a passion for art, to be honest you're with you. In good, you're actually in good company with um, the, the teaching and the creative arts because obviously there's quite a few people that have started life off as teachers. You know, Sting, J.K. Rowling, you know, Barack Obama. Uh, yeah, Cheryl Crow, you know, um, th these are people that are that are obviously have got a creative bent of themselves, and and, and Barack obviously is is world leader and an esteemed yeah. person. But wow. imagine being taught by him before. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about it now, you probably probably had a, a problem with him or something when you were when a student, but now you look back on it and say what well, a fabulous guy he was. But but looking at um, at that career, you mentioned something there, just sort of there's a little line about um, working in the film industry. Um, I understand, again, from a little bit of research, that uh, you had a bucket list of body doubles. <laughs> yeah. So, so, come on, tell me a little bit more about that. What's that all about? Uh, I don't know where you found that out from. Oh, well, you know, always. Are you a private investigator in your space? Oh, no, I think I'm more, more like maybe a Bond villain in this sort of get-up, you know, yeah. the Donald Pleasant era. <laughs> I um so I used to do stand in and double work for actresses so I would either be standing in sort of like they would just set set the camera up and the lighting and stuff on me as a just a body with generally the same body shape and hair color and stuff as an actress and then you know when they're ready to shoot I would jump out of the scene and the actress would jump in um which was funny actually because the other day when we were setting up the exhibition we had a film crew come and sort of do some interviews and stuff and someone was being my stand-in because I was kind of right. you've made it. There. You've got a body double. <laughs> I used to do that, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it was really fun. Um, and then that, or I would be a body double, so they would actually film on me, but it would be kind of like the back of my head or from a distance or my hand or something, and then the you know the viewer would think that I was the actress. Mm. And I did some really cool things. Um, I did have. Uh, I did have a bit of a bucket list I kind of wanted to double for or stand in for three Bond girls and I really wanted to do Star Wars as well um, just because I, d I just think Bond that would just be really yeah, cool yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And I've, I remember watching Star Wars throughout my entire childhood it was the first film that I saw in the cinema I used to watch it all the time with my brother absolutely obsessed and then I, I went to an audition for uh, I think it was, I can't remember if it was standing in or doubling for uh, Daisy Ridley in one of the films yeah. years ago. And I went to the audition and they were like, yeah, great, you're, you're the perfect measurements. So I think, you know, we I think we're probably going to use you. And then it just oh. never happened. I'm like, no, this is my last chance because I just don't really, uh, I don't do it anymore. I don't have time. And I kind of did it a little bit for fun eventually. Um, but you didn't, you were, you were uh, body doubles for two Bond girls. I was, yeah. So I was body double for uh, Berenice Marlowe on Skyfall. Wow. Uh, stood, stood in for her. And then uh, Eve, Eva Green. Is it Eva Green? Or Ava Green? I forget. Eva Green, Ava Green. Um, as my, well. wife, my wife's a film buff. I, I have to reload. She's, she's quicker than Google, but she's not in the room, unfortunately. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I'm not, um, weirdly. Even though I kind of have worked on some fun films, I've not that not got that greater knowledge of it I think I think once you once you work on a film the kind of um the suspension of disbelief kind of goes a little bit yeah, and then you don't yeah. watch it the same way again and you kind of think oh I wonder how this was made or oh that scene must have been difficult to film without are, I mean, the, the big budget films are massive productions that take can take years you know from from a concept through to final airing so you could have been involved in something and had to wait a couple of years before it actually came out of the screen 
Have you ever watched yourself back? Have you seen yourself in, you actually picked yourself out in some scenes? Have you ever been? No, I don't think I have actually. Funnily enough, a lot of the films that I worked on, I never watched. Not not on purpose, I just never got around to watching them. But right. there were a few, um, I just by chance happened to get some, casted some part in a film called um, Jupiter Ascending. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. came out ages ago now um and it was just by chance because i don't act at all it's a bit out there it's a bit of an out there film yeah yeah no i haven't seen it yet i will see it one day but um it was probably about 10 years ago now but uh yeah i don't act at all i don't want to act that the idea of that terrifies me um but i think they had cast somebody as one of the roles and they'd and they'd um given her her costume and it was handmade it was this really expensive costume and then she had pulled out last minute so they had to fill the part with someone that had the same body shape as her <laughs> so it just happened to be me so all the other girls that had, had been cast as various roles they'd been to like auditions and then follow-up auditions and all of this and I had just kind of wandered on set and was just like Brilliant. straight in and had no experience and I was surrounded by all these actresses and like supermodels <laughs> just me like I don't know what I'm doing here um and then they ended up just using me for loads of other bits and pieces like bits in the background and bits here and there um just because I was available and and there and uh yeah and then I had loads of people because it's um as you say it's very out there it's based in space and a lot of the scenes I was like completely bald but also didn't have eyebrows or anything that's a good look no no I can I can endorse that (laughs) (laughs) yeah why would you say that <laughs> but um, yeah it was funny because I was like no one's going to recognize me because I'm you know completely bald and not not only bald but they sort of like powdered my face while I was completely white and looked like an alien and everyone was like I think I just saw you in a in a film <laughs> I was like for god's sake like how, how can you recognize me looking like that um but yeah I, I had quite a few people recognize me in in that and um no but I've never I don't think I've ever seen myself no, it's one of those strange things, and you see people interviewed um, about their films, even you know, A-list actors, and quite a few of them have a, a strange feeling about looking back at themselves and they move on, you know, looking at their next project. Yeah. You know, I was watching the Louis Theroux interview in Dame Judi Dench, and uh, a certain number of her films that she'd much rather not think about. So it's like Cats, I think, was one of the ones that she... Uh, she oh, was, really? Yeah. I, yeah, it's funny, because you would think... Uh, it's a bit like you know, uh, sports people will watch back their matches or their games to sort of an- analyze how they did, and I would imagine that actors would do the same. But um, yeah, it's weird. It's like hearing your voice yeah. on a recording. I, I really struggle with listening when I'm, when when we're, when we're editing this, listening back to 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 me droning on. It's not uh, you hear all the flaws, the little hesitations. It's, it's That's... funny because you've got a great voice. You've got a great like radio voice, I think. Yeah, not it's a, it is actually a face for radio as well. So the YouTube channels probably not lose well. <laughs> you're, bringing <laughs> no, some glamour to it. you're bringing some glamour to it. So the the, the teaching career, um, I guess. I mean, you went to university, got your degree. Was that a right now? I need to earn some money, and and therefore looking for careers, or was that always part of the plan? No, well, I was earning way more in the film industry. Um, mm. I was earning great money, and I because it's a, such an all-consuming job. I was working sort of sometimes like six days a week, um, really long hours, yeah. not really going out and spending any money because I didn't have a life. I was just working, working, working. So my social life kind of dissipated a little bit. Um, so I was earning great money. And then I think at one point my dad just made a comment like, yeah, you're going to have to go and get a real job at some point. And uh, yeah, that just stuck with me. And I think as dads do, he just was worried because, you know, it's a great job, but I don't don't think it was really a career. Um, I was self-employed and obviously that comes with a certain element of instability. And so I went and became a teacher because uh, that's what my mum did. And that was just kind of what I thought I would enjoy and and I love kids and I love working with kids and I'd done a few jobs here and there and when I was a bit younger working with kids and uh so I, tr- I trained and became a primary school teacher and then was kind of like this is not what I want to do for the rest the of my life. dawned that actually this wasn't quite the dream that I thought I was going to have 
No, and no, and also when my mum was a teacher, which was many years before, she it was a completely different government. It was different way of life. It was just different. And so I remember her coming home from school at like half three, four, and then just sort of like watching TV in the evening and not having to mark books or do any work. And by the time I became a teacher, there was just so many things that you had to do on top of teaching and all the hoops that you had to jump through and all the data and it's off offstead yeah it's just it's just a lot and and the teaching side of it I loved but the teaching side of it is a very small percentage of what you're doing as a teacher it's like having two or three full-time I, jobs I have huge respect for teachers and and the institutions that are well I'd spent a bit of time working in a law firm and I created a, a, a new department we didn't have before which was uh, all about converting schools to academies um it was a small law firm and we were up against some bigger law firms doing the same thing but we, we could charge half the money and do just as good a job. And my job with that was, was going in and talking to the to the people in the schools. I found so many head teachers that I could just pluck out of the school and put them in business. And they would be wonderful entrepreneurs. They would be, they just had the skill set. They had the 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 now and good with yeah. people, good with running organizations, working with budgets. Yeah. Um, and you don't hear that story. You hear a lot of negativity about about teaching and I just don't think it's it's not warranted and I think they're given a really hard line especially by the government I think it's yeah. uh, it is it's, a tough a, job. it's the typical sort of like those who can't teach I think yes uh, you know if you can't be an artist then be an art teacher if you can't be an actor then be a drama teacher it, I think that actors uh, sorry actors I think that teachers get a bit of a bad rep in that sense and people presume that they get you know six weeks off during the summer and then half term and easter but the reality is that you're working through all of those holidays or you're sick because you've ta been taking in all these kids germs all, all term but you've been running on adrenaline and then the minute you have a break you get on what you get sick you get a cold or of the flu or a bug of some sort and that happened to me every time I had some had like half term or whatever um but also as a teacher you're not just teaching you're also sort of like a child therapist and a nurse and you're you know like a, a I can't even think of all the things you have to do but from the minute you get in you've got children counselor disciplinarian so, so you know substitute parent yeah. Parent, you're constant, you know you were in some ways you work as like sort of like a social worker and and a mediator for parents and then yeah it's dinner lady <laughs> it's just never ending so you kind of do have to be trained in all of these th different things just on the job and so it makes sense that people that teach then go into doing amazing things as well because yeah. you know it's a good grounding and and what but but you still uh, relatively everything's relative but looking at from, from my age you're still very young um but you take the brave step to go it alone and and follow the path of your passion what what I mean that's a big step and there are a lot of people who have yet to make that step and have harbored a, a passion or love and maybe done it for years but never really done that so so what was the catalyst was there was there an event or was it just right that's it um well the catalyst for me was teaching I think I I was in my I remember I was in my first year of teaching and I kind of had to had to really ask myself some serious questions about like do I want to do this I've just spent three years training and a lot of money doing a degree and do I really want to do this because it, it is a big risk especially leaving sort of like a stable income and going it alone and I I wasn't um you know I don't think I'm old now, but I wasn't young then. I wasn't like 18 and oh. fresh out of college. I had bills to pay and rent and responsibilities. And so I couldn't just decide to quit my job there and then and then just become a starving artist because I had, had responsibilities. So for me, there was that kind of feeling of, is it too late or is this the right decision? And I was just so stressed and so tired and so unhappy. Well, not, not miserable, but just not, not feeling myself. You know, I, when I paint, I get this like surge of inspiration and excitement. And I never got that really with teaching. It's just kind of going through the motions. And I think the, the catalyst for me as well was when I realized that I spent most of my day looking at the clock and most of my year waiting for the next break, waiting for the next holiday, the next weekend. That's, that's a horrible feeling, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's And I thought, if I'm worried about being too old now, I'm going to spend my whole life waiting for the next 
thing and, and, and literally wishing my life away. And then before you know it, it is going to be too late. So that was kind of the catalyst. And then I kind of gradually reduced my hours at the school and took up more painting and art and did commissions and sold bits here and there until eventually it kind of took off. And I was very lucky in that in that way. But I am a huge advocate now of doing what you love. And it yeah. does not matter how old you are, what stage in life you, you're at, yeah. you will have to work harder than anyone that you know in the beginning to get something off the ground. I mean, I ended up teaching in the day, tutoring in the evenings, and then painting at night or over the weekends and doing essentially like three full-time jobs. But to get to where I am now, it was so worth it. So, so worth it. Yeah, I mean... I was invited back to my old school, which is a bit of a traumatic experience, given I spent a lot of time in detention and <laughs> I was, wasn't necessarily the greatest <laughs> academic example of school to produce. It was a very old fashioned grammar school. Love the guys. They're, they're great now. It's a different, completely different school now to the one it was when I was there. Um, but I, they must have found me on LinkedIn and decided I could come and do their prize giving for them. So I had to give a speech at the end of it. And, I'd, I'd, and I've mentioned this before on the podcast, but it's it's relevant to our conversation. I got introduced. There was a there was an extra presentation they hadn't told me about to sixty of the um, uh, of the lower six. They were just just getting ready for for getting themselves off to university, and I was going to give them an inspiration inspirational speech apparently, but I knew nothing about it, so I had to think quickly about what I was going to say to these sixty expectant kids, you know students. Um, and it was co-ed. It was all boys when I was there, but it's co-ed. And I thought, introduce yourself and tell me a little bit something interesting about yourself or what you want to do as a career. Start for ten. Go around the room. That saved me a bit of time, so I'm still thinking. Um, but the shocking thing that came back was I thought maybe 20% will have a definite career path, what they want to go. 90%, if not all of those um, young people, had a very clear idea of what they wanted to do. Wow. I thought, how how on earth, <laughs> at the ages of 16, 17, have you got that absolutely laser focus about what you want to do? Um, so I, I ripped up what I was going to be talking about that evening to all the parents and all the rest of the school. I just talked about following your passion because I was genuinely worried. I thought these, there'd been an indoctrination somewhere along the line. Where they, you know, they're going to be they're going to be pharmacists, they're going to be solicitors, they're going to be accountants. Do they really want to do that? Nothing wrong with those professions, but you know, nice paying jobs. You know, sometimes you have to do what what's your passion, yeah. and you're doing exactly that. And actually you're now becoming very successful at that and will probably be, no, I don't want to jump, jump the gun bit here for you, but you're probably going to be earning more now from doing this and and building a, uh, a presence than you ever would have done as as, as a teacher. Oh, yeah. But that's by following your passion, not saying I want to follow the money. Yeah, and even, I mean, even if I'd gone into a different profession that was like slightly more well-paid and I had become, I don't know, like a lawyer or something, I still think I would be earning more now as an artist and not necessarily financially even, probably financially, but also just it's kind of more of an, an abundance of everything, an abundance of happiness and peace and friends and like you, and it just everything kind of slots into place when you're doing what you love because it's, uh, I think there's like almost a, a stigma of being a bit selfish if you kind of, do what you want to do but I find that if you do what you want to do and you put yourself first and you put your happiness first you have so much more to give to others and to your friends and family and to right. charities and if you're earning more then you have more money to do good with in the world and yeah it's just it, it was never my intention I didn't set out like I'm gonna do this because I want to improve every aspect of my life but it's just kind of organically happened and I yeah definitely agree with you there it's it's um it's so important because I I bet you know most of those kids that said that they know what they want to do when they're older probably won't end up doing that because no. things change and when I was a kid I wanted to be a vet and I would never which you could <laughs> see when you're interested in animals but you know yeah but then my mum was like would you be able to put an animal down if it was unwell and it's kind of like no <laughs> so that went out the window pretty quickly but it's just more like the science and the medical side of it that's not I don't think I would be that great at, at that so that's not you you know and 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 i i took an age to sort of find where i was going to go um maybe sort of mid to late 20s before i really sort of came into a a, a position of where my career what my career trajectory was going to be and I, and that for me i wouldn't say that I, you know everybody's different that's the other thing so we go through a, an educational system which very much delineates us by our age by our year group 
and everybody's but we all know we all develop uh, at different stages you know being yeah, in the yeah. changing room and seeing guys when I was like 12 13 and they look like middle-aged men you know hairy chests and beards <laughs> <I'm> thinking, <laughs> when's that gonna happen to me we all develop at different times yeah, yeah. So, so you know having this 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 approach is you know trying to a sausage machine and pushing everybody else through and the fact that university education is quite an expensive thing so you need to get something that pays off those bills you're going to end up being lumped with but anyway yeah. enough of that depressing stuff i want to know about what you do now because uh, i think the technical term is photorealism which is the, the sort of genre. can you tell me a little bit about that so yeah so it's basically it's art that is painted or drawn or whatever it is in a style of it's, it looks like a photo, so it's very, very realistic. Um, my style, I, I kind of, the way I work is I create something in my head that I want my piece to look like and that I want, you know, the message that I want it to sort of show and how I want the viewer to feel when they're looking at it. And then from that, I have put something together. Usually what I'll do is I'll get a bunch of photos and I'll sort of edit them all together or look at various parts of it and then edit the lighting and the coloring and stuff like that and then use that to help me create a piece uh, in real life and then I have this piece of artwork that kind of looks like a photo but it's usually um well these these pieces are all sort of coming out of the darkness so there's not not quite doesn't look like they're in the wild or anything <laughs> but or like a studio photo shoot I would say stylized but it's it's very effective because it is so realistic oh, um, thanks. That's the thing. I kind of wanted people to feel like they're actually face to face with the the animal itself rather than kind of trying to interpret a work of art it's more impressionistic or abstract um, uh, or, or instead of sort of looking just at a photo that someone's taken I, I literally want you to feel like you're looking at the animal so that you can kind of connect with that species and then in turn connect with nature and and yes yeah, sort of see the in interconnectedness mm -hmm. of in, in, in most of the, if a lot of not not all of them but in most of the uh, the examples that the 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 creatures are actually looking directly at you you know there's there's a look in the eyes which i think really is yeah i yeah i like the eyes I, I have a thing about painting eyes i enjoy it and i like sort of creating a fierceness but also a vulnerability depending on the species so for example with big cats here i've got a panther i've got snow leopard and a lion and they're all looking quite fierce yeah. But once you sort of look into their eyes, you kind of sense a little bit of vulnerability as well, because they are like all animals nowadays, quite uh, vulnerable as species. So, yeah, I definitely enjoy enjoy the eyes. How how long does it take you from this sort of initial thought about the idea that you've got through to the final brushstroke? Do you know what? It's a sliding scale. I spend about a month month and a half sometimes two months painting but then there's a lot of obviously work that goes in before that so usually it'll be sort of a minimum of three or four months planning uh, or three or four months in total sorry and sometimes an idea can be in my head for a year or two years before I actually start planning it so it, it it's how long is a piece of string really it's it's um yeah I, I literally eat sleep and breathe art and I work seven days a week so it's um yeah it's me the amount of of that you've done some time lapse um pieces haven't you where you've actually can see how long it takes literally just to build a small section of the uh the the the, the artwork together how do you maintain the motivation and the and the, the dedication to that do you do you, how do you how do you manage your time because i just love doing it <laughs> it's a bit like um if you've ever sort of <laughs> excuse me if you've ever uh, started a, a hobby like or a project um and thought yeah you know what I'm gonna I don't know whatever you're into I'm gonna build a piece of furniture or I'm gonna decorate the bathroom or I'm gonna build a miniature model of something and then you get really into it and then when you're at work you're like oh, I can't wait to go home and do that thing it's kind of like that feeling but it just never goes away because obviously I do it every day um and and I think because there's so many different elements to the job it's not just painting there's also sort of like more of a business element and there's the marketing there's the emails and connecting with people and exhibitions and uh social media and I, I do a lot of the video editing and photo editing myself so I then create the time lapses and so it feels like I'm just doing lots of different hobbies <laughs> it's not unlike the teaching job and there's, there's, a, there's a number of different facets to it but because it's your passion those other things are easier to do and easier yeah. to handle now did you like a lot of us that go into business and, and work for ourselves 
initially to build something up where we have to discover quite quickly what our strengths and weaknesses are because there are certain yeah. things we love doing for me um it's meeting people talking to people it's it's the outward facing things the things that i don't have so much joy about is about returns <laughs> <laughs> oh who does <laughs> so what what would what would you say is your um your strengths and weaknesses and, and have you you know is it, is it a case of you learning those skills or have you learned the art of delegation Do you no, see I, this is the thing. I, I personally think that if you don't enjoy something, you should always delegate. I mean, I, th I think it's always good to learn how to do something first yeah. so that you know, because I think learning how to do something is always an important skill. Yeah. Then learn how to delegate it <laughs> because um, it's just a massive waste of time. I'd, everyone is obviously different, but for me personally, when I don't enjoy something, I waste so much time uh, procrastinating and just like dragging my heels and just takes double the time. Um, for me, it's emails and admin and yeah. placing orders through the printers and organ like, just emailing back and forth for this exhibition, especially there was just so there were days when I didn't do anything but email people back and forth. And the minute that I felt ready to sort of like turn the laptop off and go and do some other work, another email would pop up and I'd go, yeah. oh, just answer this one. And then the minute I send that one, another one would come up. And I just got to a point where I just thought, you know what, well, I have to get someone to help me with that. So that is my next thing is hiring an assistant to help me with all of the admin stuff. Yeah, and and, and the, the trick is obviously understanding when that point comes. And exactly. I, think, I think the exhibition has been a great example of, of that for you hasn't it in terms of your time management and definitely. yeah I think I think uh, if I don't hire someone permanently I think I would definitely just hire someone just for the run-up to an exhibition because it's just huge putting on a big event like this in in London um you can probably hear all of the noise I apologize because I literally am in the center of London and there's sort of like drilling and cars and sirens and stuff usually in the middle of nowhere in the woods um, so yeah, it's all, it's just a lot. It's a, kind of like a sensory overload for me because I'm just such a introvert. Um, so getting someone to just help me with that side of things, I think just make my life easier. And then I'll, I'll then have more energy to give to other people and to put into the artwork and stuff. Being, being an introvert, do you, do you quite enjoy perhaps getting involved in some of the social media? Cause that, that can be quite a sort of, you can be creative without actually having to be face to face with people or lots of people through social media do you enjoy yeah. that well, I love it yeah I actually love social media I mean I don't I try not to spend too much time on it because I think it can be quite a toxic environment <laughs> um but I I've managed to sort of uh almost um try and uh create an environment for myself where I only have the people that I want to sort of see on my timeline and um, almost like I've curated a timeline for myself. So I, I actually am very lucky. I don't really see much of the negative stuff because I don't engage with any of it. And I think that the algorithm kind of picks up on what you like. So my Twitter timeline is literally just pictures of birds and my Instagram timeline is just wildlife photography and, and other artists work. And so I'm very, very lucky in that sense. Um, I love engaging with people. I love, meeting new people I think social media is great for sort of getting your artwork seen by people all over the world that otherwise wouldn't know you exist um but there's it, it's about doing it in a kind of healthy way so it doesn't it doesn't suck your energy out of you because it certainly can I mean one of the things that I, I don't think you're on TikTok or are you no, no. <laughs> I'm not no uh, it might surprise you given my age that I am on TikTok but I'm on TikTok <laughs> because Part of my work is is involved in marketing, and yeah, yeah. it's very easy to become a dinosaur, very quick to become a dinosaur if you don't keep up how these things develop and how they become TikTok. Yeah. I'm not surprised you're on it. I think it's great to get involved in like the new trends, but I got it got to a point where I was just so late jumping on that bandwagon that I I thought there's no point now. <laughs> yeah. No, and I don't agree. I mean, I don't, I, there's a, a lady called uh, Poppy who um, who was made redundant. She's a she's a chef. And um, I liked her, what she was doing with some, but she's mad about potatoes. And she did some stuff with some hash browns back in March, 2020. And we, we had a bit of an exchange with stuff, whatever, Poppy tool. And um, she's massive. She's got 3 million followers. She's she's um, going to be on a game show shortly, BBC. She's been on Saturday Kitchen, uh, mm. another one with Star Rising. Yeah. Um, and that's that's within the space of 18 months, two years. She's, she's absolutely exploded. And I think 
I, I think that's the thing. And I had a couple of TikToks recently that have, the, I think the latest one was something like 300,000 views. So wow. in it, it's, it's not my content. It's, it's repurposing something that's already been done. Whereas I think the origination of your content would 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 attract the anyway we get we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole if, you, if you're not going to do it you're going to, yeah. well, i do think it would the sort of things that you do like the time lapse and videos and stuff i suppose it's get somebody to manage that for you <laughs> just just get one of your guys i'm told giles could give you some great great yeah you know. yeah I, I think i do i need to get someone to do that because for me right now the idea of adding another social media yeah, yeah, yeah. oh i get that i completely get that yeah it would just send me over the edge I'm very happy the way it is because at the moment i my Facebook has sort of fallen by the wayside and Instagram and Twitter are kind of the main platforms that I engage in. Right. Um, I've had a few people say say I should download TikTok and get a TikTok account. Um, but yeah, if I had someone to do it for me, absolutely. Uh, but it is, it's about finding that balance, isn't it? It's just so difficult nowadays. It really is. I mean, one of the things that I, I certainly want to give time for here is, is the fact that everything we've been talking about and your creativity, you've talked about being selfish and, and following a passion. Um, you're not a selfish person. You're you're quite an altruistic person. And the work that you do um, has a payoff for those subjects that you're using for your artwork in as much as um, you're an artivist or you're involved in artivism. Uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and how that's become part of... of your yeah. Yeah. so artivism is essentially using your art for activism um, and my artwork itself isn't particularly artivism my you know, art, artivistic no that's not a word it's not we well, can make up words around it can't we really yeah, but... artivistic let's go with that um yeah i mean my artwork isn't particularly evocative or heartbreaking or shocking or anything like that um certainly no one has touch wood thrown any soup or anything over my artworks yet in this exhibition um you know i kind of aim to more inspire people and and to give people hope and and kind of to inspire a little bit more of interest in other people around nature and wildlife um, but yeah, I've, I, I'm sort of a con conservationist, so all of my projects, my exhibitions, my artwork will raise awareness and money for conservation issues. So this this particular exhibition that we're on at the moment is uh, raising money for a project fund that I set up to uh, essentially fund various different conservation product projects around the world. Yeah. So instead of donating just to a charity and having that money sort of go off and you know go wherever, I have a little bit more ownership over where the money's going, the good that it's doing, the people that buy my artwork can can see what's happening with that. Um, and yeah, it, it's, I mean, I personally wouldn't say it's particularly altruistic because I, I honestly think if I didn't do that, I probably would have burnt out a long time ago and it kind of keeps me going. It gives me more inspiration and more purpose and I get more passionate about what I'm doing when I know it's kind of making a difference so it's selfish as well as well in that sense but yeah it, it does help the environment in, in a way as well more of us need to do the same mm -hmm. to be honest we're in we're in a pretty dire situation i mean one of the the statistics which is really quite shocking is how many um, species are under threat i think the un figure was something like forty thousand. yeah i think species are are vulnerable endangered critically endangered which is ridiculous and um yeah, we're currently heading towards the sort of sixth mass extinction and scientists are saying that it's it's happening and it's the first and only mass extinction that's been caused by humans, um, which is just devastating. But there's kind of, um, I think there's a little bit of kind of worldwide apathy around making a difference and making a change. And, you know, some people don't believe there's a problem and some people do believe there's a problem and just don't think there's any point in doing anything about it. And they're not making any lifestyle changes, not doing anything because they think, you know, oh, I'm just one person. And it's a similar sort of outlook to people that don't vote because they're kind of like, well, what what good will, will I do? I'm just one person. But if everybody thought that, then- I think you're an example of how you can make a difference. You know, I mean, your background your 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 experience you know why should it be you that's doing this but you are doing this we can all do something exactly. uh, whether yeah. it's growing veg in your back garden or whether it's it's being um using your art to to raise awareness um, and on that point um and I'm, I'm very conscious of time with this the exhibition is due to, to open very very shortly um <laughs> what i what i would like to do if it's possible 
is to have a look at some of your artwork in a bit more of a, a closer, closer view for those who are looking on YouTube. And bless you if you're listening on the podcast, we are going to work at trying to give a description. <laughs> and maybe because of the time, we could pick maybe a couple of, of the pieces. So yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I'll that. work with you on the timeline because I can I can talk to you all day, but it, it, it's okay. obviously you don't have that time. I'm going to unplug my laptop, so I hope that the screen doesn't go all dark. But uh, let's go. I'll take you for a little walk. So we've got we've got pangolin over here. Pangolins, as I said, are the world's most trafficked mammal. And is that is that 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 tra the scales of injustice? And that trafficking is that because of um, there's a particular cultures that find it as medicinal purposes or yeah, some exactly. Other it's the scales they they in um in certain cultures they they think that the scales have uh, medicinal or magical uh, purposes but they are literally made of keratin so it's the same as our fingernails um absolutely no medicinal purpose whatsoever the um, image the, the image we're looking at is a is a is a is a, um i suppose it's, if it looks very much like an antique but with scales <laughs> people who don't know what a pangolin looks like google it um, but but this is a, a beautiful image of one side profile um, with a, a very black um, out of a black background, so it stands out the foreground with its tail to the front. It's uh, it's beautiful. Oh, it's very good. Yeah, I wanted it to sort because of, actually there's quite a lot of negative space in it, and I kind of wanted it to yeah take the vulnerability of these creatures because they're so small and sweet looking. If you've ever seen one, they kind of roll up into a ball to protect themselves. They become a little cannonball of scales, don't they? Yeah, they're really funny little things. I I'm, I really like them. And people that sort of learn about them, I think, sort of develop a little bit of uh, in, a life for them as well. In certain cultures, they can, because I was I was went in for the competition to name it. Um, I can't remember. I was looking to the background of, and and it's good luck if you see one, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's yeah, it's something to do with how many steps they take. That's right. Um, how many years you're going to live or something? Yeah, that might not work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> It's great <laughs> cultures incorporate the animals into their uh, into their, their myths. Like. Amazing creatures. And then we've got the snow leopard over here, um, which was inspired by one of our projects that we're uh, funding. Oh, it's beautiful. So it's probably going to be backwards uh, because uh, of the camera, but it's essentially a snow leopard walking towards the viewer with quite a stern look on its face. Yeah, full profile, looking like, don't mess with me. Um, but equally, it's got a little scar on its nose to show its vulnerability. Um, its paws coming towards you, its sort of left side paws coming towards you. Um, this actually, the Snow Leopard, was the um, the project that I supported in, in the donation. Oh, uh, amazing. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so this one is really exciting. It's, um, it's basically tracking the effects of climate change on snow leopards because there's been interesting sort of developments in terms of their habitats and there's been sort of cases of uh, regular leopards sort of taking up space in their habitat which is very unusual for snow leopards and normal leopards to kind of be in the same space so they want to set up cameras and sort of track the effects of, of, of the climate change on on the snow leopards and see if they can find them to be to protect them so that that's the reason why I painted this piece it's fabulous. It really is, and and quite apt. I don't know who named this one, but they that you've been named it stealth because that's exactly the image that's that's portrayed, isn't it? That was my dad. <laughs> Good uh, man. And then I'll show you the uh, painting which was revealed at the opening night the other the other night. Oh wow! No, I've not seen that one. Or well, you just you posted something on Twitter, I think, this morning about this one. Very special chimp. Um, she, her name is Wounder, um, and she. She actually went viral on the internet a few years back because she was rescued. Um, she was she sort of fell victim to the wildlife, sort of the illegal pet trade. Yeah. And, um, she was in an absolutely terrible condition when she came to the uh, Jane Goodall uh, Institute Rehabilitation Center, and uh, she was emaciated. Her her name Wunder actually means um, close to death. And so they they really had their work cut out. She was actually the first chimp to receive a chimp to chimp blood transfusion, which is quite. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, they managed to save her. They they took her over to the um, to one of the islands at the rehabilitation center, and she lives there now. And recently had a baby a baby boy called Hope. Mm. So this piece is going to be going up for auction um, in the next few weeks. There's an event 
called the, uh, An Evening of Hope with Dr. Jane Goodall. And this piece will be going up for auction and 100% of the money will be raising raising money for... Uh, Absolutely fabulous. So yeah, that's that one. And then finally, I'll show you this one because it's kind of, kind of apt. This was the piece, it's a polar bear piece. Um, and this was what kind of inspired the whole collection. It was painted almost as a direct copy of a photo that I took in the Arctic. And I was looking over the top of, of the boat down below and a polar bear. As you passed by. Yeah. Yes, yeah, suddenly passed by. We were on the pack ice. And um, it was just a great composition with sort of, um, for those of you who can't see, it's kind of two bits of floating pack ice and the polar bear is walking from one to the other with the fading footprints. Um, just coming off the off the and canvas. The go from the right to the left, and it's just leapt onto a to a, what looks like a another a larger piece. Yeah. Of yeah. So I thought it was quite symbolic because uh, obviously you've got the sort of melting ice yeah. towards one side, and then on the other side you've got fresher, sort of thicker ice. And um, yeah, obviously the the ice is melting at a very very fast speed over in the Arctic. So. And if I'm right, that's thin ice too. That is thin ice too. Yeah, there was a, a thin ice one which was uh, in a previous collection. That was another polar bear. So I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it in the, the same vein. They are one. really, they are really excellent. They really oh, are. Really thanks excellent. so much. I'll uh, bring you uh, bring you back to the table. Here we are looking at the yeah. We, we're walking around the the Oxo. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a great space. It's absolutely huge. Um, we were a little bit worried when we turned up the other day and uh, to set up and I saw how big it was <laughs> and uh, I panicked a little bit so I thought oh god you didn't need to panic it's it looks excellent oh, thank you thank you that worked you were a bit concerned about <laughs> you did a really good job with that That's... Well, I've got uh, I've got a tremor uh like an essential tremor and in my hands and it's Okay, sometimes if I'm super calm and really chill, but when I'm tired, which I am very tired at the moment, like goes with like a really, really, really shaky. So I was worried that I would be like shake, shaking with the camera, but yeah. Gosh, that's not something you want to. Uh, is that is that in both hands or? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's a sort of like a hereditary thing, to be honest. I've had it since I was a kid, and my dad's got it, my sister's got it, and it unfortunately it gets worse with age. But I'm um, hoping that I can still paint okay, because <laughs> uh, yeah, it's well, if the yeah. evidence is to prove around you. There's um, there's a good chance you're going to be doing this for many many years. Um, just just while we're we're on the um, we've been looking at the painting, can you perhaps just give um, Alice an opportunity to to understand how they might be able to find out a bit more about you and perhaps get to, to, to understand a bit more about your conservation work? Yeah, of course. So I've got um, a lot of information on my website, which is sophiegreenfineart.com. Uh, oh, someone's just tried to come into the exhibition. One minute, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so sophiegreenfineart.com. Yeah. Uh, so lots of information on there, loads of information about the collection and the exhibition and the... Um, the all the conservation projects that we're supporting and stuff like that and then i'm always posting on social media as i said so instagram is sophie green fine art and then twitter is sophie green art and you can find me there as well okay so i know you need to let somebody into the exhibition we're going to keep them waiting outside um i can bring this to a, to a conclusion if you're, if you're happy to um and then you can you can obviously start the exhibition and do what you're supposed to do <laughs> Um, thank you so much for spending so much of your time with me today and uh, and for sharing uh, it's inspirational i mean i had extra questions we can we can we can perhaps ask those and you can email them back the answers and i'll stick them in the show notes so people can, we can see do a part, we can do a part two another time after the exhibition or something but thank you so much um it, the, the work you do is inspirational um you know the planet really needs people like you and raising awareness such really important issues um and uh, and follow you and follow your journey with all this fantastic work sophie thank you so much thank you thank you so much for having me it was great to chat and uh, yeah thank you for sort of knowing you know knowing me so well <laughs> actually researching me instead of oh, that isn't creepy that's just what we do with the podcast i've heard a couple of a couple of people get, who've, who've uh, guests on the podcast who've said they've been interviewed by people who just said right tell us about yourself it's like I <laughs> I've, had I've had that quite often actually just interviews or radio shows or you know Amazing. I don't get it because people are busy but they're kind of like so who are you <laughs> no it's no. lovely to chat to someone that actually knows their stuff so thank you so much for that I was very very grateful
You're very welcome, Sophie, and uh, more than worth it. Thank you very much for your time. Enjoy the rest, the rest of the exhibition. I'm sure it's going to go by great steam. Thank you. Fingers crossed.